um, really jointly um, represented. It is is an environment what creates opportunities for writers and writers, actors, crew. Essentially, as the majority of our work is production and producing, we then are those who are on the board. And we also have income generating um, opportunities for suppliers all the way down the stream. And when we say things that were generated, what we take from this is that we are the ones that take us, we take us created for the entire production market and the line as we read in production spend also flows into the economy during during the short short sometimes short can be three days can be six months can be two years and um, that period of production depending on the size of the production and the type of production essentially if you go if you look at the and the cultural observatory study they they see that as six to eight percent of it the economic development we're speaking of our broader base have a huge economic argument if you go to if we go go into the next slide um which really talks about the benefits for the wider economy. Being the, the select committee on trade, industry, economic development, small business development, tourism, employment, and labor, I think this slide will speak to you very directly. Same as what was presented by the commercial sector, very good, also generates locally for local producers correct opportunities. For instance, let's speak of tourism as a tourism research. Locations where successful content has been filmed has back in 90% increase in tourism visits. That, that speaks for economic development and contributes to, to, to FDI. Cultural affinity survey, for instance, whereby UK, Brazil, France, um, they then said that they were 3.1 um, times more likely to visit South Africa um, just by watching um, literally three productions Blood and Water, the Oscar winning um, Octopus Teacher, and Seriously Single. Three productions. Imagine what happens now. We have well over, and I can tell you now eyes closed, well over a thousand productions where there's stills, commercials, TV, um, film taking place right now across the country. And imagine how many eyeballs and opportunities there are for induce, for, for induced economic participation from the, from, from the AV in, industry. Um, just a few examples on that when we speak to tourism, and I just want to just, I'll, I'll finish very quickly. For instance, if you look at films that have been, have been, have been made across the world, some, some films that you recognize, Robin Hood, 2010. Sherwood Forest, England received a 5.5 increase in visitors, 500,000 more visitors a year. Twilight Saga, Washington, they, their hotel visits increased by 1,000%. Um, if you think, go to things like fried green potatoes back in the 1990s, um, well over another 100,000 visitors um, visited Georgia State. Lost in Thailand, Chinese road, road, road movie, Literally, tourism investment of as much as 29.6 billion Thai baht, which is $1 billion, into the Thai economy. On and on and on. Lord of the Rings increased by 400% after the films premiered. Imagine what it could do for, for, for South Africa. So why am I saying all of this? And again, if you look at the um, slide number seven, which is the analysis of, of, the, of, 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 the, of our, the speed of spend, a major production company production of spend of $220 million budget film shows an average of $10 million is spent per week over a 15 week shoot. Translate that into rands, we know we could possibly be, lo be losing out on. How the AV sector works, most production companies are small micro businesses and this speaks specifically to the small business development in um, colleagues here, mainly small and micro businesses in production and down the line. And most of them are being um, level one and level two. The majority of our production industry 
are black participants. They are black business owners and they are young business owners and there are a lot of female business owners in that. Our process really is from development stage to pre-production and to production and then into post-production and distribution. And I want to point out that right now we are speaking mainly on the copyright amendment bill. However, the performance, um, performance protection amendment bill, we also take into consideration. But I would like to point out that this juncture is where the performance element kicks in. We as the production space have to protect the development, which is the creativity, the script writing. And we, if we don't protect the script writing, we don't participate in this process and protect script writers, there is no way in which we could then exploit in the, the good way of exploitation, take that script, monetize it, commercialize it in order for us to create business, jobs, um, social cohesion down the line and FDI down the line in the entire product um, value chain process. And further to that, when the film is pr produced through marketing and tourism, there are induced opportunities for film production. In pre-production, for instance, we also have um, the, the process of pre-production, which is location scouting, finding locations, exposing the those behind the scenes to who we are as a country. Now I spoke very, very, very um, openly about the amount of people that come into our country due to content production. Production post-production literally is then putting the um, production together, whether you're doing documentaries, whether, whether you're doing um, film, creative film production, is all the same process and post-production is a space place where we put together and we um, we weave together South Africa as it looks. Distribution, very important. That's how we get the stats in. If we do not have the protection of the right at the beginning, which, which producers do, we're not able then to showcase what South, who South Africa is. I'll hand over to Nick for him to continue. Nick? Krish, this is for you. Thanks, it is for me. Thanks. And just speaking to Aza's point about the people who are serving on this committee, we felt it very important for you to get an understanding of, of the impact of this sector on all of the different sectors that, that you represent. So the creative industries contribute 3% to South Africa's GDP. That compares to 2.51% in agriculture and 3.2% in tourism. Of that 3%, the AV sector alone contributes 30%. It's a hugely significant contribution. Pre-COVID, the value of our sector was around 8 to 10 billion and 3.4 of that was foreign direct investment. And that was just in terms of, of um, international servicing work. That, that wasn't foreign direct investment in international co-productions and in local productions. This sector grew at 5.2% year on year, significantly higher than the national average and significantly higher than growth that is being predicted for the country at the moment. We employed 60,000 full-time FTE and freelance jobs. But when you take all of the induced jobs down the line, that figure, according to the South African Cultural Observatory, sits at 120,000 rand. It's a, 120,000. It's a significant number of jobs. And those jobs, firstly, you know, people tend to have a, a bit of a, a misconception about what, what the industry is. And they think of the film industry and they think of, of kind of Hollywood and, and the Hollywood actors, not everything that happens all the way down, this big grinding entity that ends up making a film. So those jobs range from highly skilled world-class cast and crew, right down to artisans and unskilled new entrants who don't even have to have matric. They only need to be able to hammer a nail into a piece of wood who can get into the industry and go on to build lifelong successful careers in the industry. 85% of our workforce, as, as I referred to earlier, is from is Black, from the Black population groups. 65% of the workforce is under the age of 35. That's massive. In a country that has such a magnificently terrifying youth unemployment statistic, that 65% of this workforce is under the age of 35, how we can contribute to addressing that crisis and towards the country's ability to achieve the 2030 NDP goals. Again, coming to the value, the added value that our sector has, 
Our employment multiplies 5.6 versus all industries at 3.1. Our economic multiplier is 2.82 versus all industries at 1.75. We contribute meaningfully to direct and indirect taxes right throughout that whole value chain and all of those downstream beneficiaries. And what several of you might not know is that even if an Idris Alba or a Tom Cruise comes to shoot a film in South Africa, they have to pay tax on their earnings. To the, to the South African Revenue Services. As has been mentioned repeatedly today, South Africa is a premier filmmaking destination. We literally have everything it takes. We're sitting with a golden opportunity to become the world's leading destination for filmmaking. Local content is the biggest driver of advertising revenue for all local broadcasters. Of course, there is the incalculable value that this sector's contribution to social cohesion, national identity, heritage and culture, telling our stories to compatriots and to the world brings. And as Aza has illustrated, it promotes brand South Africa and drives tourism. There are a couple of other figures here on top of what Aza has mentioned. In Game of Thrones, just for Northern Ireland, because it shot some scenes in Northern Ireland, brings in $40 million a year directly attributable to Game of Thrones in tourism. Croatia, which is a country with similar economic challenges to our, ourselves, achieved 203 point something million dollars over a five year period, 2013 um, to 2018. Next slide, please, Nick. However, the reality of our industry today and the reality of the industry upon which you're going to be making such a profound decision is that it has shrunk over the last couple of years down to 2.89 billion. It has lost jobs, it has bled jobs from 60,000 down to 12,775. 38% of businesses have closed. In Q2 and 3 alone in 2021, we lost at least 2.5 billion rands worth of international productions that were intended to be filmed in South Africa and moved to other countries. And we'll address the reasons for this in the next slide. So to assess, assess this shocking figure that I've just given to you, we need to look at what is happening globally. Globally, this sector is one of the fastest growing sectors in the world. It's growing at about 25% per annum. Does this country, does this committee not want to do everything in its power to ensure making this sector as viable as possible to achieve those kind of growth rates to the benefit, not of the sector itself, but to the benefit of the country? I won't go through the figures that we have here. A lot of what we have in our presentation, which is very wordy, is for you to read at your leisure. But just to say some countries, I spoke about Croatia earlier, um, which was kicked off by, by the benefits they saw from Game of Thrones. Croatia, Romania, Greece. Greece is now known as the new Hollywood of Europe. You can't walk down a street in Greece without bumping into a Hollywood A-lister. And the UK are quite literally running out of equipment, studios and skills to service their production booms. There is massive infrastructure build happening in those countries as new studios need to be built, particularly because those countries require studios in a sense more than South Africa does because we have all of the um, locations and, and weather and light to shoot outdoors. So South Africa is currently not only shrinking its own industry, but also losing out on this share of massive global growth as workers moving to other countries. Almost worse than that, or hand in glove with that, is that we're rapidly losing key and scarce skills to these countries. A few months ago, a South African woman went to Ireland and she started a crewing agency for South African crew, where she does everything. She organizes the work permits, etc., and they either get paid in pounds or dollars or euro, euros. Within three days, she had 175 of South Africa's top scarce skills on her books to leave the country to go and work in countries where there is work. And why has this been happening? Because of overarching policy uncertainty, 
which includes challenges with the DTIC incentive scheme, both on the policy and the administration components thereof, the electricity crisis and crime, all of which equal a loss of investor confidence. Ours is a high-risk industry at the best of times, and in South Africa, these factors are making it just too high risk for the due diligence that I think Stephen mentioned to advocate for work to be brought to this country. And we assure you, this will worsen under these bills. We'll see this already struggling to recover industry struggle even more. Their inherent legal and financial uncertainty will further elevate South Africa's international risk profile, not just in terms of our industry, but generally as a country and how our investors view it from a risk perspective. Without a conducive, globally attractive, internationally aligned and competitive legislative framework, the country will lose billions in economic activity and FDI and the thousands of jobs that come with the industry. I want to get on to our direct response to the bills. We've, we've outlined what the impact will be, but here is our direct response. And the overarching response to this committee, the overarching plea is please don't believe the myths that are being woven around, around these bills. Yes, everyone says the bills are controversial. They are controversial, except for the fact that almost as we have seen today, and as you will see in, in your future days engagements on this, almost the entire business end of affected industries are absolutely united in opposing the bills because they will reduce work for everyone, not because they want to put more money in their own pockets, but because work will dry up for everyone. It says the bills will take South Africa into the 21st century. They simply won't. They'll take the entire value chain of all the creative industries into a seriously bleak future. These bills are pro-poor. No, they're not. The poor will get poorer because there'll be less work for everyone. This one is something that, uh, that we... Uh, particularly rail against, and that is the perception that is being advocated that the anti-bills lobby represents foreign interests and big business. On the contrary, the anti-bills lobby represents, as Azania said, those thousands of small businesses, mostly black and large businesses, who are all trying to create work for the creative industries and the satellite economies. As Lazarus said earlier, it could be more appropriately argued that foreign business, foreign interests and, and big business best describe those who are be behind the pro-bills lobby, those megalithic companies which stand to gain most from these bills being passed. The comment which has been addressed elsewhere this morning that fair use exists elsewhere in the world, well it does to an extent, but absolutely not as we have it contained in our bills. This provision is a hybrid mess, which will open the door to wholesale and undefendable copyright infringements. The, the loud claim that we hear, actors will be better off by getting a share of profits. They won't. If you share in the rewards in any environment, you equally have to share in the risks. This will mean they'll get lower upfront payments with no guarantees of future royalties, because as in an earlier slide, about nine out of 10 productions actually don't make a profit, profit, and there'll be less work for them and everyone else under these bills. Royalties on nothing equals nothing. It says the bills are internationally aligned. They are simply not. Apart from other lack of alignment, they do not pass the three-step test. They contain provisions that will render South Africa a total global outlier, and they will be a serious deterrent to working with or in South Africa. Next slide. Thank you. So we have a range of government initiatives which are absolutely laudable, and these bills I suppose, are intended to be one of those government initiatives. 
that recognize that the creative sector should be supported by government as a sector that has the potential for growth and job creation over and above its role of facilitating dialogue for nation building. This is an extract from the NDP 2030. The presidential master plan is another serious initiative which seeks to implement plans to optimize such economic recovery, growth and job creation towards NDP 2030 goals. Several provinces, including Gauteng, have listed the AV sector as a priority sector in their, in their strategies, with Gauteng, for example, aiming to position Gauteng as the hub of Africa's creative and cultural industries, and I quote, to position this important sector and unlock its dynamic, dynamic potential role in job creation, social cohesion, and nation building, and to make the province globally competitive to attract international productions and stimulate animation and gaming production. These noble plans, these noble ideas will simply not be local investment in the sector will initiatives and cost not just producers, the industry's transformation and development of small, often black owned businesses, but the country at large and must please be avoided at all costs. Next slide, Nick. So Coming back to our response and the stated objectives, we agree that the bills need to be updated. They're hopelessly updated, outdated. They need to be modernized, especially for this new digital era. And we recognize and support the noble intentions to improve the lot of all in the creative industries. However, please believe us when we say the bills will have the exact opposite effect. And I say this not just because I want to protect the AV sector and the producers and the production industry. It's because I'm passionate about the country and I, having studied these bills, recognize in depth the economic impact they will have, not just on our sector, but on the country. They'll drive away investment in local content, local productions. We have the same as, as Bobby described earlier. We have different kind of pools of, of work in the industry. There are local productions, there's local TV, there are international co-productions, and there are international productions, which we refer to as servicing work. And that's where foreign studios come here and a local company will make the film here. So <clears throat> with the bills being so out of line, of, of any um, copyright regime anywhere in the world. They'll stifle opportunities for international co-productions. Why, why would another country want to work with us when their, when their legislative framework is so markedly different to ours and ours is so much more punitive than theirs? It'll see the big budget international productions taken to other countries along with the massive investments of FDI they bring and the thousands of jobs they create. Why would they want to come here? Somebody earlier spoke about that dynamic mix of the factors that they look at and the intense competition that is increasingly happening around the world as countries are trying to make their countries more attractive, not less attractive as South Africa is, more attractive to stimulate, to stimulate the attraction of foreign productions to their shores and everything they bring. These bills will put a total stranglehold on the industry, but most particularly on the small and emerging production companies. They'll frustrate transformation efforts in the ability in the industry and the ability to build sustainable industries. Why? Because sustainable IP is the new gold. If, if we talk about mining and what global economy is going to be built on from now onwards, IP is the new gold of economies, being able to hold on to IP to consolidate rights in, in productions is that which enables sustainable development of companies. It'll make it nigh impossible for young emerging filmmakers to make their first productions, which serve as calling cards for future work and growth. They simply won't be able to comply with the bills. How will they be able to pay the minimum rates as prescribed by the minister? How will they be able to even figure out the complexities of royalties provisions and 25 year rights reversions? This is just not an empowering bill. We have the president having established the, the minister in terms of red tape, and these bills are going to 
increase red tape a thousandfold and they increase the financial and administrative burdens on producers and production companies to try and comply. The registration and reporting requirements are just one such example of that. Importantly, we're trying to build film collaborations across Africa with our African Continental Free Trade Agreement and with BRICS countries, several of whom are massive film producers. We all know about the size of the film industry in India. But with our bills being so out of line, any opportunities for these filmic collaborations will be reduced at the best. Ultimately, work and income generating opportunities for all for absolutely everybody, for the writers, directors, the cast, the crew, the man who hammers in the nail, the worker who's employed in a restaurant because a film shoot is happening and they suddenly are getting more business. All of these downstream beneficiaries will have significantly less opportunities and the country will lose the many benefits this sector offers and its potential to contrib contribute to economic recovery, growth, jobs, skills transfer, such a critical thing in international films. We have the leading crew people, the leading film industry people coming to work here, and they're working with our locals who used to working on little local TV productions or a film shoot that they scrabble together with friends. Here they have the opportunity to work with and learn from the world's best. As you, as, um, as you round up, uh, because... Uh, almost uh, 30 minutes is gone. Oh my goodness, I ha I'm sorry. I have to hand over then, I'm sorry. We have to address our specifics around the bills. My apologies, over to you. Yeah, let's, con let's continue. Essentially, if, if businesses in the sector die, we inevitably cannot secure work for performers um, and then be able to enact any issues that are there. In three minutes, just wrap up because you- We are wrapping have, up. have exhausted your 30 minutes. Thank you so much, Nick. I'm going to allow you to continue. I think these, these points have been made. Let's continue to with the next ones. Great. Well, thank you both. Um, I think uh, with that, what time we have left, we're going to delve very briefly into the details in which the devil dwells. Uh, this is the unwaivable statutory performer royalties. Uh, and we've actually provided in the presentation for you guys to see the extracts from the bill itself. So you can see that it says what we say it says just for cross-reference and, and ease of reference. It's frequently claimed that this is going to be good for performers. In a nutshell, it won't. It's going to be terrible. Uh, they claim that it's contractual exploitation is the main driver of poverty. It's wrong. There is no impact assessment that can verify or validate any of those claims. We maintain it's always to do with the lack of work opportunities. As you can see here, we've provided all the figures, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of brands being paid to performers for their performances. Um, you, they think it'll give them protections. It won't. All it's going to do is reduce work opportunities because what typically happens is they get paid an upfront fee, like the CPA was referring to a little earlier. And then nine out of 10 films do not make a profit. So performers will have to be compelled to work on risk, wait years to receive anything, but most likely will receive nothing. And when you're working with su subscription-based uh, streaming services, how are we going to work with them? If they're required to pay a portion of royalties, which is defined in the bill, the only sections where it's there is 6A and 7A, which is defined as gross profits. How is that possible when their revenue is generated through people subscribing and paying to access their entire catalog, not specific titles, their entire catalog? How does that work? It's unworkable. The, the biggest thing is that everyone imagines that this is film and television, but it's all audiovisual works. When it comes to the corporate work being commissioned, the, there are bread and butter are ads. It's corporate and commercial work. It's selling goods and services. How does that work if we're compelled to pay, well, in a, it would be our end clients would be compelled to pay our performers a portion of their gross profits. They simply will not use local performers. That's what is going to happen. Everyone only framed this in the way of film and television. They did not even consider the ad space. The compliance and reporting is a joke. It's actually worse to commit the compliance and reporting FAPA than it is for anyone to commit piracy. The penalties are far worse. The minister would be the one prescribing rates. One size fits all never works and has been reiterated by so many other people who preceded us. Um, the assignment term, 25 years. 
is so insufficient. It is impossible for investors to make back to make any profit. Sometimes some productions, if you, if any of you have seen Arcane on Netflix, that took 10 years for them to make. In my experience, in some cases with some territories, with some licensing rights, sometimes they want access to those territories for up to eight years. So in essence, you can cash in two invoices. That's it. And then your rights are gone. You're not able to use it anymore. And unless everyone agrees to the renegotiated terms, that's what's going to happen. The way that they thought it would work is that it would be a reversionary right. So the rights will go back to the original owner after 25 years, but it doesn't work that way. The way it's currently written, it doesn't function that way. It's just a cutoff. That's the license period. That's all you get. You get 25 years. I really hope you can make enough money in that time because these productions cost tens or hundreds of millions of rands. How are we doing for time, Chair? You, your time is exhausted. Uh, right. Yes. Okay. Are, are we getting into Q&A? Nick, well, I, I just think... continue because we have points to make. Just continue run through and then apologies to everyone. Please, Nick, you have a minute. Let's go. Sorry, okay. Chairperson. I appreciate your patience. Right. Okay. So the, the main the, the thing... Biggest, the, the biggest yes. problem now, you are creating, you are creating crisis for the meeting in the sense okay. that... Gotcha. Okay. It just, maybe, just maybe, in a maybe, nutshell. Let's let's do this. Let's do this. Uh, wrap up, and then we'll invite uh, uh, members to to see us as to whether are there any interesting questions, but also uh, we'll look in the chat and see as to whether are there any inputs made. Absolutely. Defer to you, Chair. Uh, let's 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 try to find out uh, from the members uh, whether they have any other questions to to, to raise because uh, <clears throat> I think what 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 is quite uh, key is the fact that I think uh, uh, in terms of uh, where you started we were able to outline the key the key the key the key aspects of uh, of uh, uh, the uh, of your presentation. And I think what will be what will what will be quite critical is uh, is the fact that I mean uh, from your from, 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 from your we went through a presentation and there are a number of issues that we have highlighted. Uh, uh, you, uh, you 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 clearly you clearly, you clearly uh, say uh, the the government's initiative to reform. The outdated uh, copyright and performance uh, right uh, must be appreciated. But you list a number of areas, and I think those areas we have correctly kept at them from, from, from your presentation when we went through it. Uh, I think some of the issues that you raised uh, uh, relates to the uh, the uh, the different market realities and establish business practice. Those are the issues that from the presentation that you send us, we're able to detect uh, the issue the issue of uh, uh, contractual freedom. Uh, you indicate that uh, that space is invaded. These are some of the issues that you picked up from your, from, from your presentation. Uh, you also have an issue with regard to uh, section 39B that's what we picked up from uh, the presentation that you send us, but also the remuneration of others and performance. You made you made a view in regard to that, and uh, particularly with regard to section six a to 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 eight a, uh, and then uh, uh, <clears throat> and one of the issues that, that that you are raising is the is the issue of uh, of uh, the enforcement. I don't know. Maybe you can just probably uh, raise that because the, the 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 intervention by the minister is aimed at uh, enforcing uh, of the enforcement of the bill uh, to uh, remedy or assist rights holders to combat infringement and piracy in the online arena. Maybe you can just probably say a word or two in relation to that because it's not that we are not we do not capture the gist of the issues that we can pass in the. In what you send to us, maybe we can just probably just respond to that whether we have correctly captured the thrust of your of, of, of your presentation. Uh, other than I think where you started, yes. What's your grace on it? 
I'm going to let Nick continue. But essentially, yes, you, you've cap, you have captured the, 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 the salient points of our presentation. Um, but I know that there are just a few others that Nick wanted to just elaborate on. Nick, can you continue and finish off completely? Very quickly, uh, when it comes to fair use, everyone keeps on saying that this is a, a contention between fair use and fair dealing. But the truth is that when they refer to fair use, it's not fair use as is commonly implied in other jurisdictions. There are very important salient differences. There, there's an overbroad and overextended uh, list of exceptions and limitations to copyright exceptions, which is going to be a big, big problem. It's going to create all kinds of illegal uncertainty. People talk about these tribunals people are going to be able to access, but it doesn't afford anyone access to the advocates and attorneys who need to represent them in court. And therein lies the most expensive thing. Then that's why it would be absolutely impossible for those who don't have the means to pay to protect and enforce their copyrights. And, and there, that's the biggest challenge. It's, it's actually going to, to be at the detriment of those who are disadvantaged the most. It's going to put them at the worst disadvantage. And there's there's a backlog currently in the US of, of a few copyright cases that have been elapsed for over a decade. And even in South Africa, our design uh, courts have been backlogged for a year. So unlike fair dealing, you actually have a situation, you can't tell someone to cease and desist utilizing your copyright. They can continue to do so until such time as the courts have made a ruling. So it's not something that at all benefits creatives, not in the least. Yeah, no, I think, I think that let's 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 uh, let's just uh, uh, pause there, Nick, uh, just to reassure you that uh, uh, we have correctly captured uh, the the thrust of uh, of what your team uh, put across to us. Like as we indicated, uh, uh, we. We had the, the pre, we had the benefit of going through of, on through what you have sent to us, and and, and therefore uh, be rest assured we we, we 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 understand the thrust of where you come from, uh, but also uh, on behalf of the committee, let me uh, extend a word of gratitude to the to, to the opportunity that you seized in terms of uh, canvassing your views in response to the invite that we sent to you. Thank you, uh, Tim, Grace, and Nick. Thanks a lot. Thank you for your attention and much. indulgence. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thanks. Uh, honorable members, we will then uh, move to the next uh, uh, presenter. Uh, the presentation uh, will be will be from uh, the South African Democratic Teachers Union, uh, SATU. Mr. Maruleki is on the platform. Mr. Maruleka, Mr. Mr. Maruleki, uh, the platform is yours. Good afternoon, uh, Chairperson and uh, honorable members of the um, NCOP. Uh, I need to request your permission, Chair, if I can share my very brief uh, presentation. Yes, yes, uh, you have uh, the platform, uh, Mr. Maluleke. The chairperson, Mr. Maluleke, um, has been given um, co hosting permissions. You have the hosting rights? Yeah, Mr. Loading Chair. Okay, I'm not sure if you can see the uh, the presentation from my side. It is visible, uh, Mr. Maluleke. Okay, thank you so much, uh, uh, Honorable Chair, um, for the opportunity um, and uh, uh, to honorable members um, yeah, and our colleagues. Uh, we uh, take this opportunity uh, with both hands uh, in order to express um, our, our submission that we have done, Chair, uh, over several times that we have made written submission in terms of the uh, copyright amendment bill. 
Uh, we have also submitted a letter from Education International, which is uh, an organization that represents teachers, educators from the pre-school uh, to tertiary institution, representing about 32 million uh, um, education workers across uh, the globe, uh, which is the biggest uh, union, which uh, basically have been working with us uh, in the best interest of our children and the best interest of our education librarians and our tertiary institution um, in South Africa uh, in order to see um, ourselves um, moving forward uh, in terms of this particular amendment, uh, copyright amendment bill. Uh, since the, 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 the beginning of this particular debate, uh, we have been um, supportive uh, to the uh, amendment bill to the extent that we have always wanted an engagement, to the extent that, Chair, I can indicate that um, we were coordinated into a meeting where we were differing on our own at UJ uh, University, uh, University of Johannesburg, where we also met those who were against the amendment and those who were for the amendment in an attempt to making sure that we understand exactly where uh, we differ uh, so that uh, we are able to assist uh, the parliamentary processes uh, to be able to deal uh, with these particular um, um, uh, issues uh, so that we are able to move towards uh, the finalization of this particular process. So Chair, um, we, we, we in the country represent more than 264,000 um, teachers in education, um, in particular in um, public education and uh, in private uh, um, institution. Uh, and these uh, educators are also in um, uh, our TVET colleges and our community education and training uh, colleges, um, uh, basically. So our purpose basically, Chair, is to making sure that uh, there's free quality and inclusive education for all in our country um, based on our um, current uh, uh, legislation, but obviously uh, based also in terms of Article 26 of our uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We're working with a number of organizations in the world and universities to even extend this particular Article 26 uh, to the, uh, the, the rights to education um, and our constitution. We also see ourselves as a professional uh, in that uh, we also have a revolutionary duty chair to ensure that we are change agents. We making sure that um, um, our students are liberated from uh, poverty by making sure that uh, their socioeconomic um, um, aspirations are able to be uh, realized, uh, utilizing the classroom as a very effective side of struggle where we empower them. Um, but obviously in line with the socioeconomic uh, emancipation, we're pursuing free quality education, which is inclusive uh, for all our children um, and are able to realize their potential to participate in the economic mainstream of our country to overcome poverty, unemployment and inequality. We believe that the education um, is, a, is a game changer uh, to the extent that we can be able to change this and therefore we need access to information, access uh, to resources, access to a number of uh, technological issues that basically are governed and regulated uh, by the, the, the copyright that is there currently. So in terms of the current copyright law chair, uh, we have noted the following, that uh, it's deeply rooted in apartheid education system. Um, you would understand that it's more than 40 years old of this particular legislation. Two is that it fails to address the daily needs of our teachers, learners and librarians, basically by imposing unnecessary restriction on access to teaching and learning material. We also have noted that it prohibits uh, the, con the conversion of teaching and learning materials into accessible formats uh, for teachers or learners who are blind or visually impaired, thus putting them at a serious disadvantage to those who um, are cited above. To the extent that um, our colleagues from Blind South Africa have even had gone to court in order to then say our expression and the plight of these particular um, 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 students, teachers who are um, living with these disabilities have got to be taken care of. Um, and our colleagues uh, were able to be listened to to the extent that uh, at least we should be, be continuing with this but that dialogue as South Africans uh, with the sole interest of making sure that we can have a law that can really uh, take us forward. Um, we also would want to note uh, quickly that uh, this particular 
uh, act now as it currently is, as we're saying, it's rooted in apartheid education, a perpetual discrimination and lack of dignity in our educational system, contrary to the spirit of the Bill of Rights and other related international instruments. So we believe that uh, the writers of this particular amendment bill uh, were right to be looking forward and then looking into making sure that we are able to address those particular needs that will then really take us forward and move away from that which was created uh, by, by, by the apartheid system in order to ensure that it perpetuates what continues to be there today. I can tell you, Honorable Chair, that our education system was the most heinous crime um, in our country that which was uh, that was created by apartheid. Because if you compare Dembisa and Soweto just as townships themselves, you would realize, Honorable Chair, that um, in Soweto, they were high school, but for many, many years uh, in Tembisa, there was no single high school to the extent that it was a creation in order to have got cheap labor and so forth. And to access and address those particular backlogs, we need more information, we need more access, we need fair use, we need exceptions, we need limitations in order to be able to expand the knowledge base, in order to expand uh, the ability and the capacity of our ed educators, our researchers and our academics to be able to write more, to create more, to making sure that we have got those particular access so that our children have an opportunity uh, to participate in creating an inclusive economy that will take care of all our people. If you look at Katle Home, uh, you compare Katle Home to Soweto, you will understand that in Katle Home, there were no high schools for many, many years because it was meant that you have got to pass your, your primary school education and then you go and work in Jamestown, you go and work in Springs in terms of those particular areas. So we are looking into those things. So why we support uh, this particular uh, corporate Right, amendment bill chair. Uh, Honorable Chair, um, we believe that this bill is aligned to the Bill of Rights and therefore it is key to turning our backs on the past. We have to dismantle the statute of apartheid, copyright legislation, and fast track access to teaching and learning material. We believe that it enhances access and uh, to a sharing of teaching and learning materials uh, for face to face and blended as well as online learning, including distance learning and also training and lifelong learning. We also believe that uh, why we support is because this particular bill brings about access to quality teaching and learning uh, materials to realize and achieve knowledge contribution without borders and without really um, um, also uh, undermining those that are creators, those that are authors, because we believe that is a balanced kind of a, a, an amendment bill. We believe also that it promotes conversion of teaching and learning materials into accessible formats for teachers or learners who are blind or visually uh, impaired um, um, uh, in, to realize their potential. Uh, so Chair, in terms of the technical inputs on the, book, on the, on the, on the sections, we have already made submission uh, in terms of uh, section uh, 12 uh, B to D. Uh, we have made uh, you know, you know, detailed submission, which I may not be able to take you through that because we have written on numerous occasions. We have presented in all, you know, in all session that we have been afforded to, to really explain our position uh, and our aspirations and our hopes and our, our, our plea uh, in terms of us uniting as the people of our country uh, to then say, let's find each other in order to ensure that this particular bill is passed and we support it. So basically we are saying in terms of section 2b to d uh we're saying these are very permanent you know exceptions in particular for education and research fraternity because they enhance access and sharing of teaching and learning materials for again face-to-face -face and blended and online learning obviously including distance learning and you know training and lifelong learning as well as access to research sources going nowhere if we're not able to you know to to increase the amount of research that we can do and to increase that particular research as we need to create more people who can be part of researches to resolve our problems in this particular country. Unemployment of 34, 32% is unacceptably high. Uh, we cannot have the inequality that is there in our country. We believe with these particular uh, exceptions, we are, can be able as educators, as academia, to be able to address this particular thing. So in terms of section 12H, uh, which is the fair use provision, 
We believe that it promotes access to information for all in the domain of the fourth industrial revolution, which is characterized by coding and robotics in the classroom in terms of the contents that we find ourselves, that we must be able to have our teachers being able to uh, learn from those who have created and then those who will be also acknowledged and be remunerated for their work. At the same time, we be able to say, it's not that we are calling for that we just use anything that has been created um, uh, without really acknowledging those who have created. We will be able to acknowledge as the teachers, as the educators, and so forth. So we believe, Chair, that uh, this is aligned with the Bill of Rights uh, and therefore is also promoting um, uh, Article 20, uh, 26. Uh, of the Universal Declaration of Rights, which we are saying we are going to, we are, we are already partnering with many universities in the world to ensure that it's also extended to the right of education for the child and so forth. So Chair, we in support of this particular bill and we are saying change is painful, but it's necessary. We're saying the time for the uh, co copyright amend bill uh, uh, is now. Uh, that our economy needs this particular uh, copyright amendment being for creativity and innovation. And as we are saying, our educators, our academia and so forth will have an opportunity to write more uh, textbooks, to write more readers, to write more uh, books so that we are able to create a learning nation, a learning nation that will work together in order to ensure to build an inclusive economy so that we're then able to you know, um, um, uh, do away and, and deal, dismantle the pillars of apartheid that basically have done two things and the colonial education that has done two things. One, it has been able to designate value to a particular race uh, and this is the majority of the black children who don't have these particular things. Majority of the black people don't own publishers in this particular country. And we need to encourage them to be able to come on board in terms of being writers, authors and so forth. We need to do the second thing that it did. Honestly, it was really to design opportunities for a, a minority and very small population, whereas the majority of the people were not having the opportunities. We see uh, the transformation of our legislation in our country addressing those particular things so that all of us move forward and say we need to open opportunities for all we need to be able to make sure that everybody has a dignity they've got the value and therefore they can be able to move forward in terms of that we cannot continue with others not having access to education access to material access to technology in terms of the format that can be you know easily be trans you know to translated into learning and so forth so we support the current provisions of the, uh, the Copyright Amendment Bill, Chairperson. I want to thank you with the honorable members. We thank you so much. We are happy that uh, we have made our submission in writing and we have made those particular submission in hope and we, we are happy that they have been captured and that even those who were opposing the bill we have looked at what has happened again, that we're hoping that we can come together and say, we as South Africa, let's be like others who have created and built their own economy using the fair use uh, you know, principle as well as exceptions and limitations that are there in their own legislation, whether it's in the United States of America and whether it's the European region and so forth, we have got to move forward and uh, embrace uh, the amendments that are, uh, are there in the, in the bill. Thank you, my chairs. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Marileke from uh, SATU for honoring our invite. Let's just check from the members as uh, well. Are there any other seeking, seeking questions? Uh, let's, let's check. Let's check the charts. Let's check the charts. Uh, uh, now let's 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 look this chart because the chart is is for members because the rules of the rules of uh, parliament applies to this committee. But I think uh, I guess you have. Uh, uh, correctly pointed out, uh, Mr. Maluleke, uh, as the community, we we really appreciate the effort that you took in terms of uh, honoring our invite. Uh, the the uh, thrust of what you presented to us uh, is that uh, the the organization uh, uh, supportive of the of the bill. And you have uh, uh, made a comparative analysis of the current uh, uh, copyright regime that is uh, that is more than forty years old, and that uh, the uh, 
uh, and we also put emphasis on the transformative nature of the of the uh, of the copyright amendment bill and the and and and, and the uh, extent to which uh, it broadened the scopes, uh, particularly with regard to sections that you have highlighted in your presentations, and uh, we will definitely take into account uh, the views that uh, that we have presented on behalf of Satu in our interaction with the with, with the with, with the report. Uh, and on that note, uh, again on behalf of the committee, let me express a word of gratitude to to, to you for honoring our appointment. Thank you, uh, Mr. Manuleke. Thank you, uh, thank you, honorable. Thank you. Any last word, uh, Mr. Manuleke? So we part no, thank you, Honorable Chair. We want to thank all the, the members. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. We don't want to take much of your time. Thank you so much. We really appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, honorable members, we will then uh, move to the next uh, uh, presentation. Uh, the presentation is from uh, uh, is, is from Professor Maliba King Barrera. Uh, the floor is yours, Prof. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. I hope you can see my presentation. Yes, 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 we can. We yeah. can see your presentation. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chairperson and um, the entire house today for uh, inviting me to make my presentation. I, I have appeared before you before in a form of um, a workshop, and I'm yes. here today to also um, um, share my thoughts on, on, on the bill. What I'm going to be focusing on today is particularly copyright amendment bill, uh, less so on um, the, the performance protection bill. And I think uh, with uh, the latter, there isn't really much of the controversy, um, although it is there. So um, by way of just a short introduction of myself as Malwa um, Gemforere, I work for the University of the Witwatersrand um, as a professor of intellectual property law. So this is the subject that I, I really like a lot. And um, I have written a lot uh, uh, on the bill, particularly focusing on the music industry and the audiovisual. And I must confess that uh, since the law reform is quite big, one hasn't been able to look at each and every uh, provision. And one of those provisions that I regret not having looked at earlier is the fair use, but today I'm gonna talk about it. So honorable chairperson, I can see you, not my presentation. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I, I guess you have the hosting rights. Yes. Uh, uh, then uh, do, do the right thing. <laughs> okay. Let me do that. Host disabled participant screen sharing. I think that has been disabled. All right. Uh, Enrico? Um, check, I'll check, I will check um, as far as I can see. Um, let me just double check. Um, I don't know what, okay, apologies, I've just made it the co host. You, you, you are the co host now, uh, Professor. Okay, right. Let me share again. So as I have said, this is quite a huge uh, law reform process that we are looking at today. And um, also I haven't been able to listen to the other presenters that came before me because of load shedding, but I have listened to the last two that uh, came before me. And I want to say to the Honorable House that um, everything that I have had said by the audiovisual industry, it's exactly what I'm going to say. I, I, I fully agree with them, except that uh, the conclusion that I'm going to reach is, is, is rather different from them because they are calling for the rejection of the bills. And I say, no, we can work with the bills. And um, my conclusion is that we need to focus our energies on, on salvaging the bills because I think that would be a wasteful expenditure after this long process that lasted over 10 years. 
Right. So the clauses that I'm going to focus on are just um, quite a few is the fair use, uh, that is section 12A and other exceptions. And it is the mandatory royalty in the film industry, as well as the compliance of section 19D of uh, the bill with the Marrakesh uh, Treaty Article 4. So starting with the fair use, um, I'm gonna, I've, I've taken time on fair use. And the idea here is to work with um, uh, the Honorable House on this clause, which has become uh, you know, a, a household name in, in our houses. I think it is the most controversial clause in, in, in the bill. So the fair use that is being proposed is going to replace fair dealing. And this is the background I want to give, uh, or I want to make to the Honorable House. So it is going to replace fair dealing. And the fair dealing clause that we have has only been litigated once uh, in the case of Manuel. And when you look at that decision, you don't, you don't get the sense that there is a problem with um, the fair dealing. You don't get a sense that fair dealing is inadequate. So that's what I would like to bear in mind. It's, it's a very well-reasoned judgment um, and, and I respect our cause for that. Mm -hmm. And fair use has been copied from the United States, as we all know. I think the US is the pioneer of fair use. And again, there are just a handful of countries that um, are using fair use right now. And those countries are Israel, Malaysia, Poland, Singapore, and South Korea. This is to the best of my knowledge, the countries that I know. So the rest of our uh, over 160 something countries are not using fair use. That we should bear uh, in mind, um, honorable chair. So um, as I have said also that it is the most divisive clause, it has divided South Africans into groups. There are those that um, are happy to, to have fair use, such as statue that we have just had now, and there are those that are opposed to it. So interestingly, what we need to know is that those who are, who are rejecting fair use at the South African industry, as the audiovisual um, uh, uh, pre presenter I have just said to us, it is actually like that. I have taken time to go through the past um, submissions made to the house to actually see who are the interests uh, behind fair use and who are those opposing fair use. So um, there are, I want to share my screen here because I have done it myself, but Wiki, Wiki, Wikimedia has, has done an excellent job, Chairperson, and I'm going to share with you now uh, what they have done in relation to, um, so these are the supporters, and this is the work by Wikimedia. As you can see, the supporters, Wikimedia there, can you still see my screen, Honorable Chairperson? Yes, yes, we can. So. But that's Wikimedia recreate blind essay. Uh, you look at them, there they go. Uh, there, University of Cape Town, South African Guild of Actors, South Africa, Satu, Wikimedia, right to know. So, when you look at this uh, uh, the, uh, players, chairperson, you will realize that these are the players that are not in the business of content creation, these are the consumer. And one of them that is not, that I, I didn't see here, which I know is Google as well. Uh, the, and, and those are the interests behind fair use. And I think as, as parliament, since your role is to create a conducive environment for economic growth, while also taking into account the interests of the public, um, I think you have to know who are the interests behind fair use. So that in your wisdom, when you advise yourself as to whether um, what you do with fair use, at least you know that the industry is opposed, members of the public and the organizations are that are um, advancing you know, uh, you know, public interests, they are for fair use. So we should know as parliament that we must strike a balance 
because if we don't, I think yeah, you are, we will you are, you are freezing, you are freezing prof. Can you just repeat what you were saying? Um, I don't know where I froze, but I was simply saying that as parliament, your biggest role that you are entrusted with is to create a conducive environment legally and otherwise for the business to grow, for the industry, for economic growth, while at the same time taking into account the, the, you know, the public needs. So we need to strike that balance. And it is therefore of utmost importance for you to know a, an excellent work that was done by Wikimedia here to show who are the interests behind fair use and who are uh, opposed to fair use. Let's look at who are opposed to fair use. You see it's, it's Copyright Coalition of South Africa. And as far as I know, this coalition, uh, is, its membership would be, um, you know, other organizations such as um, SAMRO, SAMBRA, uh, uh, Capasso, and this are uh, the industry in the music industry that I know of. We are who are members of Copyright Coalition of South Africa, uh, Coalition for Effective Copyright in SA, Publishers Association of South Africa, SAMRO. There we are, uh, and Dalro. Uh, my apology, my apology uh, your screen is not moving. Let's uh, go to, the, to those that are opposed. That's where, that's where you were. Okay, there we are. Can, can you see Dalro, um, Anfasa, Pan Africans, Multi Choice? This are our industries, uh, Netflix, Motion Picture. There are many. And effectively, Honorable Chairperson, this is the industry. These are the drivers of the economy. So let's bear that in mind. In, in whatever that we are going to do with fair use at the end of these parliamentary processes, we should bear this in mind. Okay, now let me go back to my let me go back to my to my screen here. So again, I, I just want to unpack fair use for the benefit of this house. For the house to know what are the problematic areas, because even when I uh, uh, logged on, the presenter uh, from the audiovisual industry, they said that, well, we have had people say that fair use exists in other countries, but it has been modified, and the modification is what has beleaguered South Africans. So, Honorable Chairperson, I'm going to show you what those modifications are and where they are. So as, as you see here, we have fair dealing uh, clause and the fair dealing clause has actually been in, in, our, in our bill. It has actually been spread into section 12A fair use and section 12B, which is the specific exceptions to all works. For instance, under fair dealing, we used to have as one of uh, the fair uses, judicial proceedings. You don't find judicial proceedings under fair use, but you find it here under specific um, exceptions. So this is what I wanted to share with you, um, that whenever we talk about fair use, we mustn't forget uh, Section 12B, because Section 12B augments um, uh, Section 12A on fair use. So. Right. So I have listed here the uses that are regarded as fair under fair dealing and under fair use. I haven't listed all of them because they are many, but they are not problematic per se. Now, where is the problem? The problem in as far as I'm concerned is that remember with fair dealing, it is closed. That means any use that is not listed under section 12A, I mean, under section 12, it cannot be brought in anyhow. It can't, it's a closed list. Whereas under fair use, it is an open list. So you can bring other further uses, all right, in, uh, in court and say, well, this, this is also part of fair use. So you see, um, Honorable Chairperson, here we are sitting here. We have looked at um, the fair uses, those uses that are regarded as fair, which is uh, such as um, 
for you know uh, research and personal study. But and and that is the parliamentary process. Now, any other uses that are going to be included going further will be done by the courts. Are we guiding courts as to how they can include those new other uses? Currently not in the bill. And to me, that is a red flag. We will be delegating the legislative process onto the courts without even giving them guidance. And to me, that is a problem. So we need to have a criteria that is going to assist the cause in including other new uses. Honorable Chairperson, I hope I made myself clear there. Yes, yes, you have. Okay. The, regulation, right. well, the regulations not uh, uh, bridge that defect? I, I, I I, I don't know. I, I really don't know for now. Maybe, maybe it can work if uh, those factors can be included in the regulations because regulations are easier to change, uh, I, you know, other than the statute because the statute, it might take us 20 years to include other factors, whereas in the regulations, it would be faster. So maybe it would work in the regulations. And if you were to ask me, Prof. Ferreira, what, what would be those factors? I would say to you right now, I haven't thought about them. But we need them. We, we really do need them. They should be there. Otherwise, we would have disappointed uh, the South Africans here by taking the parliamentary prerogative of making laws and dumping it with the courts. Right, and then I move again about uh, another problem, uh, problematic area. Remember, Honorable Chairperson, we have copied fair use from the US law. But what we have done here, which is what is making everyone to, to really be upset with the fair use, we have now included or modified the criteria now for determining fairness. So remember, we don't have the criteria for including new uses but we do have the criteria for determining whether the use is fair. So this is, this is where we, we, the modifications come in. One is under section 12A, um, uh, Roman figure three there, AA, whether the use is different. So I'll give you an example, um, honorable chairperson, if I will be precise here about this one, whether the use is different. Let's say, for instance, I have written a book. And uh, obviously, the book that I have written, maybe uh, the target market is for, you know, is for readers. And you take my book, you make a film out of it. So you realize that that can be regarded as fair use because you are now using it for a different usage altogether. You are not competing with me because my target is the readers, are uh, the readers there. But your target here is, uh, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a film. So, and you may not be paying me anything because it, that would be fair use. Is that fair really? I don't think so. Because even today, if you take a book and you make a film out of it, you are going to pay me some, something. You have to pay me something. And that's how uh, the industry is working. And that's how the industry should continue working. And the other one is uh, here, the substitution effect upon the potential market. So that's what we have um, uh, tweaked there, whereas the US uh, requirement is that we should look at the effect of the use upon the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work. So this substitution effect that we have here, it's, 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 it's driving South Africans very, you know, it's, it's putting them in a very bad space. So that's where the problem is, honorable chairperson. And that's what this house should look at. Okay, so now I conclude on fair use. So uh, when I started off, I have said that there hasn't, there, there hasn't been any problems really with the application of fair use. So in light of there being no shortcomings on, on the current fair dealing, 
And in light of the fact that there are very few countries that are using fair use, I have mentioned five or six. Mm -hmm. And also looking at the pushback from the industry, and also bearing in mind that one of the reasons for why we have started on this particular law reform was to come to the plight of the artists. Um, that, that, you know, we, we can all remember the Copyright Review Commission and how it was started and the recommendations thereof. So, the, and, and again, looking at the advice that was given by the four member panel of experts to parliament about the, this law reform. Why not retain fair dealing? That's really my question to the, the Honorable House. That, you know, you look at what we have, fair dealing, only lit litigated once. And in that one occasion that it has been litigated, there hasn't been any problems with it. And there is really pushback from the industry. And we must remember that we are a kind of country that is battling high rates of unemployment. And also, we have artists here that we want to see them as, uh, you know, elevated to the Hollywood artists. So why do we want to uh, press ahead with fair dealing? Anyhow, um, the compromise also can be that, you know, we should just cut and paste from the U.S. fair, fair, fair use. We should get rid of these modifications because they are making people upset. So, and, and um, aware that copyright law is rooted in um, technology amongst others, I, I would be skeptical also to have a rigid uh, law such as fair dealing. All right, so right now I'm critiquing myself. So I would be hesitant to say, let's stick on to fair dealing. When I know that uh, technology moves fast and that copyright is, is, is in that, law, that aspect of law that goes together with technology. But at the same time, we really have to bear in mind the unfavorable position in which fair use as it is in the, fair, as, as it is in the bill finds itself. I pass honorable chairperson and I go to the other, you know, other exceptions. They are many, they are scattered throughout the bill. Uh, and I, the, 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 the prof now has a, uh... My time? Yes. Okay, let me let me just wrap up, Honorable Chairperson. Um, you know, everywhere or you know, almost many countries today, we know that um, uh, uh, you know copyright owners used to get income from from the reproduction rights, but reproduction rights have been diminished by technology, and in our case, as yes, South Africa, by also it's gonna be they're gonna face further. The, uh, um, the income is going to shrink further by the introduction of many exceptions. Anyhow, that's besides the point. But whenever we, we have this uh, uh, private copying that we have in our bill now, which I'm very happy that we have, uh, we must also accompany it with uh, copying levies. I don't know how we, uh, we ended up not having the provision on copying levies, but we should have the provision on copying levies. And that is going to uh, increase the pot for South African artists for them to get remuneration because we cannot limit technology. Everyone copies, honorable chairperson. And mm -hmm. as they copy, they impact on the income of copyright owners. So many countries today have copying, copying levies. And there is this global body here called uh, CISAC. They have done excellent studies. They show that many countries now are collecting more revenue from copying levies, which is being distributed uh, to our, our, our artists. And now I quickly want to touch on the mandatory royalties on uh, uh, you know, section 8A on the audiovisual industry. I coin carefully with the previous speaker from the audiovisual industry. Uh, the one thing that I want to highlight here, honorable chairperson, is that we are still growing as uh, the South Africa audiovisual industry. We need a lot of capital. We need a lot of investment for us to be at the, the, the Hollywood uh, uh, you know, uh, level. And with um, the introduction of mandatory royalties, I wonder who is going to uh, want to invest in uh, 
uh, you know, young and, and not so well-known artists from South Africa. I, I don't think that we are going to grow this industry if we, we are going to go by royalties. And honorable chairperson, I think sometimes, okay, because I'm out of time, I just want to highlight this. Our, here, I made an analogy about royalties with um, <laughs> the medical aid schemes because I wanted everybody to really understand. You know, in South Africa, we all understand how medical aid works. If you are in a closed, you are either in a closed scheme or you are in the open scheme. So in the open scheme, you really have to save, you know, if you are constantly sick, you are going to run out of the funds and uh, you, you're going to be on your own. So, and, and if you are young and you are not sickly, then it's an advantage for you because you don't get sick. By the end of the year, you still have money in your medical savings account, well done. But how about that old, very sickly person? They, they, they are really in the red. If you are in a closed, if you are in a closed scheme, I mean, no matter how much you get ill, honorable person, you always have funds because you are being subsidized by those who are young and healthy. In the same manner, in, the, in, in this industry right now, if we introduce mandatory royalties, those that are going to do very well would be your A-listers. And do we, are, we, are we in that category where we have many A-listers in South Africa? I don't think so. We are still young and growing. And I will remind you that at some point, multi-choice was complaining in the previous slide I mentioned it, multi-choice was complaining that, you know what, Netflix is uh, you know, in, uh, competing unfairly because at the time multi-choice was losing a lot, a lot of customers. Why? Because multi-choice was forced by the local content requirements as per the statement that was made by the CEO at the time. And so multi-choice was arguing that on the other hand, Netflix is not faced with our local content requirements. So they are able to have in their rapporteur like Hollywood movies, whereas we are constrained to our local production and people are not viewing, people are leaving us for, for Netflix. So now if we are going to impose mandatory royalties, I think we are going to disadvantage our people Honorable Chairperson, I, I just want to show you because I am in, as much as I'm not in the audiovisual industry, but I am an academic, I write books. I wrote a book, Honorable Chairperson, I will show you this book. It was at the time when it was new, it was selling um, uh, 206 US dollars and I was going to get royalties. I mean, I would sit, uh, on a daily basis, imagining how rich I am going to be when getting the royalties. Honorable Chairperson, I have never even got a thousand in rents uh, for, from my royalties. Right now, my book is selling at $148. So the, the mantra about royalties can actually be a myth. And I think today, if I was given a lump sum by the publisher to say forever, here is uh, 10,000. Maybe I could have bought myself a TV, you know, but I don't have anything to show from royalties that I was expecting from selling of my book. And that's exactly what's going to happen to our people as uh, the previous presenter from the audiovisual um, has, has, has made. So, so uh, section 8A, again, what it should not do, it should not impose mandatory royalties. Rather, it should look at uh, introducing fair and equitable remuneration, copy from the EU from this, uh, at this point in time. I have looked at the EU clause, I have written about it, and I think it is the way to go. And uh, also, again, in line with the previous speaker from the audiovisuals, I say that let us respect parties' freedom to contract because the, the, the mandatory royalties is going to just uh, take away that. And um, we must also have a renegotiation clause because there are times where you pay me 10,000 as a lump sum upon signing a contract. And then, you know, uh, surprisingly, the movie becomes a hit. 
So what do we do? Uh, because you have given me 10,000 rand, we should have a clause that makes us to go back to the talking table and renegotiate. And I think that would benefit our people. And there is also a clause on, uh, on reporting. It's excessive. I have written about it elsewhere, and I want to repeat it here, that um, it's excessive and we must be careful not to, I mean, careful about the admin cost because with more uh, admin um, work that we are creating through excessive reporting, the costs are going to increase. We may end up incurring more costs on administration and less to give to our people in a form of royalties. And lastly, Chairperson, I think we should sometimes just let the industry govern itself. It's a complicated industry. I, for one, I, I can claim expertise in the, in the fields of um, copyright, but from time to time, I still have to go and understand how they work. They are quite complicated. And I think we cannot, again, we cannot, um, we cannot hold developments in the industry with the law. Right now, uh, I look at all of them. You look at Netflix, you look at Amazon Prime, they are selling subscription. And I don't know how we are, they are going to pay royalties when really they are working on subscription. Like right now, I have, an, I have a Netflix account. I cannot remember the last time I logged on to watch movies. However, they are still able to take my money and pay the, the, you know, the, the artists, all right? But if we were to work with the royalties, we know that with royalties, you get as much as your, your, your views have been. So if your views have been very little, you will be like Forere and then get nothing from, um, you know, from their work. And I don't think that is the situation our people want. So lastly, we, there is um, uh, section 19D and there is a blind SA decision that we know. There's also a Marrakesh Treaty that we are yet to ratify. I looked at the decision. It introduces adaptation as an exception. I just want to alert you to that honorable chairperson so that you can align section 19D, the blind essay decision with the Marrakesh article four. As to how you are going to do that, I will leave it to the wisdom of this honorable house. And I thank you for giving me an opportunity to present today. Thank you, honorable chairperson. Thank you, thank you, Prof. For uh, taking us through your presentation. Uh, let me check with honorable members whether there are any uh, clarity seeking questions that honorable members uh, would want to pose. Chat, chat. Uh, I know they have been here since 10 o'clock, so probably <laughs> the, uh, the, this is too much. Yeah, just just, just uh, on, the, on, on the point that you raised, uh, Prof, on the in reference to uh, what the industry says uh, uh, in, 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 in taking the bill. The industry itself, uh, is it broad enough? Is it, uh, is it, is it transformed? Uh, is, 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 is it not mon uh, monopolistic? Uh, the structural challenges around uh, broad representation in the value chain, because I thought the the thrust, the thrust, the thrust of the bill is to address transformation mm -hmm. in the value chain of the of the of the, of the industry itself. Yeah. I think, honourable chairperson, um, uh, if we have the transparency clause, that will compel every CMO in South Africa to be transparent on their affairs. And that being overseen by, for instance, the regulator CIPC, I think will we'll, we'll go somewhere very far. Coupled with uh, the requirement for fair and equitable remuneration, I think we will go very far. So basically what I'm saying is there are two ingredients that for me, I think are necessary. One, if we have an organization that is owned by uh, the members. And I think that's, that's one of the clauses in the bill, which I applaud. Uh, so this, this CMOs here would be owned by the members. 
and um, so the the functions of the of the CMO would be they would be reporting to the members. And if we as members own the organization, then I think we own many things. And again, if uh, CIPC has a, a much bigger and clearer role, supervision role, I think we will beat a lot of um, uh, problems. Because a, a lot of times when you read on the news, you will hear that uh, this particular CMO has not dispersed um, uh, royalties and so on. People don't even know how much is due to them. Those are the problems that we have. And those are the problems that I think uh, the bill is, is, uh, has dealt with them in some of the provisions. As I have said, honorable person, is that uh, unlike the industry, and, and this is where we differ, unlike the industry that is calling for the total rejection of the bill, I say we, we can work with this bill. We can, we can focus on rescuing the bill it would be a wasteful expenditure. And there is really a lot in this bill that is good for, for South Africans. So we should not overlook that. No, thank you, thank you, thank you, Prof, for that comprehensive uh, presentation in response to our invite for you to come and make an input. You are correct, it's our, it's our second engagement uh, from the workshop that we had and we, on behalf of the committee, indeed, uh, uh, let me extend a word of gratitude to the efforts that we put uh, through uh, preparing for this presentation. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson, and uh, to the entire Honorable House, thank you for the opportunity. And um, I wish you well with this uh, excruciating law reform process. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Uh, we will now move, uh, uh, to the next presentation, honorable members. The next presentation will be from the Goodwill King uh, Advertising. Goodwill King, I guess it's uh, the uh, presenter is on the floor. That's Hello. Okay. Yes, Mr. Can you hear me, honorable chair? Yes, we can hear you, but uh, there yes. is an echo. There is an echo. I know. I've, uh, I can understand. I've, uh, that's the reason why I decided just to jump into the call, because I've, I thank you very much, first of all, um, Honorable Chair, for inviting me with your team. Um, unfortunately, because of load shedding, I had to move to a venue, which is public, and I've asked them to reduce the music, and the echo is not going to stop, and the music is not going to stop. So your team has asked that if it's possible that I can ask you for maybe a reshuffling, a, a proper date. And then in terms of my presentation, I focused on real-life case studies, because um, I've put in 24 years behind um, this research real-life research uh, that affects me directly um, and highly prominent uh, artists, creators, and uh, global brands that are operating within the country. Um, and I, I really feel that is something that you, you can see. Um, but right now, I don't think it's going to yeah, work. Yeah, yeah, I, can, I can hardly yeah, hear myself yeah, think. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, Chi? Chi? Yes, Maria? Chi, can I, can, I, Chi, can I offer a suggestion? Chi, can I offer a suggestion? Um, yeah. Our next presenter, Artist Unite, are here. If we can maybe check if they're ready to present. And then um, I know Mr. Um, Bata has indicated that he's got load shedding from 2 until 4. So um, okay. maybe if he can come in afterwards, because our slots for the 7th and 14th have already been filled. So um, rather than move to an, an, a new day entirely, can we maybe ask him if he can maybe just um, come in after the next presenter? It, it, it will be a little difficult because I still have to go back home. The, the distance from, from where I am to home uh, is going to delay you guys as well. Yes, uh, uh, let's, let's, uh, maybe, uh, let's, let's try to find, uh, to, 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 to accommodate uh, Mr. Mbata. Uh, in uh, our next in our next uh, session, uh, uh, because definitely uh, uh, we, it, it is not it is not his fault. It is the load shedding, so we are sensitive to to, the, to that uh, situation. Uh, 
-hmm. When is our next uh, session, uh, uh, Madia? Um, our next session is on the 7th and the 14th of March, Chief. But if I can just um, indicate that there are two presenters. In fact, us as the last um, stakeholders on today's program, we've also got the Library and Information Association of South Africa. So what I'm suggesting is that we can have those two presentations and then have Mr. Mbata come in entirely last, which is at half past four. That's what he will be. He will be ready by then. If he, if he's not uh, ready and still experiencing the challenge, uh, we will we will definitely uh, slot you in the next presentation, in the next date of uh, of, of, of presentation, Mr. Mbata. Uh, I I'll, think I'll do my, I'll do yes. my utmost best. I'll stay. Lo I'll go home and log on, um, and and continue engaging and listening and taking notes as well yeah. and then if there's an opportunity for next time i'll definitely take it okay no good no let's 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 close it on that note um, Mr. Butter. thank you uh, and then uh, uh, uh invite the next presentation from the library and information association of south africa uh, good afternoon chair and uh the select committee. Thank um, you, thank you, Mr. Mulapo. You are welcome. Thank you. Uh, can I present you? Yes, yes, the floor is yours. Uh, we are mindful of, uh, of the challenges that you are going through. So if you are not affected, then the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you, Chair. Um, I hope you can see my slide. Yes, we can see, we can see the slide. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of LIASA, which is the, the, the libraries, Library Information Association of South Africa, which is a recognized, SACWA recognized professional body, which was uh, established in 1997 through the measure of two historically a racially divided association, Salis and Lea and Alasa, to form this new body. Uh, it's an, we, we are a non-profit organization uh, uniting uh, people working in the libraries and information services in South Africa. So what we're looking at here, the, the crucial role that is played by the libraries in the archives uh, and information sector, it's internationally recognized. Uh, even you, by you, 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 you have uh, 30 minutes, uh, Mr. Mulapo. I thought, let me just, uh, Mulepo, let me just uh, bring that point right at the beginning. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we, we uh, in organizations such as WIPO that um, recognize the role that is played by the libraries, and we, we are also um, Recognize in terms of uh, in the country, uh, within the constitution, and uh, and uh, in in terms of upholding the, our constitution and African cultural renaissance, um, you can find these documents in 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 the in the in the in the in the in the, in the document that we had, we had shared with the with the parliament. So, if you look at the mandate of the libraries, they are basically three that are in the legislation where one is to is to meet the information needs of the country and to to serve the creators and producers of the knowledge teaching and related programs including literacy and copyright awareness trainings legal deposit libraries and collect and preserve of document heritage and perpetuity i'll come back to that especially when we discuss the issue around fair use, key players in the knowledge chain. And we are the custodian users and, and creators uh, in terms of the digital world. So, so what is the challenge with the current uh, legislation? As the, one of the uh, uh, presenters mentioned, it's, it's really outdated to be exact 43 years old. And therefore it, 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 it it's not assisting uh, the current environment where we find that we are in the digital digital environment. So it has also in our industry, it has a debt limitation, uh, limited exceptions.
for libraries and archives to, to serve the, the, the communities that they need to serve. And we have, we have been arguing since 78, uh, 1978 for these exceptions. Uh, although they, they, they were a little bit changed, but nothing has happened since 1978. And, and as a tertiary sector, the library and the tertiary sector have been calling for these uh, balance amendments since 1998 to, so that they, they could be of assistance to the country. And lastly, we are actually moving to the digital age and the current uh, copyright legislation has serious limitation when it comes to that. So it, 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 it therefore provides a, a limited uh, vibrant environment for, for it to be able to adapt to, to those needs of, of the sector. The current copyright law also affects the access to information which severely hampers library and services archives. It, it restricts and prevents, um, it restricts and prevents sharing of information. It prevents using material for exhibition and historical commemoration. And it also uh, lack access to information of which then affects the social economic development and prevents citizens from from becoming effective in com uh, contributors to the economy. Because it, it, it's, it's easy for, 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 for other colleagues who, who have the means to argue that probably the, 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 the current uh, copyright should continue, uh, the current status quo should continue because they could afford. But the reality is that the majority of the, of the people that you serve, the majority of the country, uh, citizens of the country, the current situation cannot exist any longer. And, and the other thing is that our cultural heritage is at a serious risk. One of the two uh, things that have happened recently, we've seen in 2021, the, 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 the fire at the Czech Reading Room Library at the University of Cape Town. It destroyed a, a, a collection that that uh, unfortunately is irreplaceable, and we have seen quite a library spending in other parts of the country, whether it's due, due to process or nature. What that means is that all collection that is only kept in those libraries is no longer available for for anyone in the world, and that could have been avoided had we. In, in, in the early, early 2000, when we as the, as the sector were calling for allowing digitization for preservation uh, without um, this copyright uh, 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 barrier. And, and, and because of that, and if, we, we look, if we take an example only of, of Jagger Library, they lost approximately 70,000 items, which included film, DVDs, and, and university calendars. All of those things could have been saved. We could have an elect if we just digitize those things. But now the current legislation prevents that situation. So if you look at the framework of the amendment bill, this bill was informed by regional and local and international research based on these treaties, the WIPO treaty and, and some proper proposal on the limitation and ex uh, exceptions for the libraries and archives. So when I speak here, Chair, uh, I just want to make, make mention that every time when I'm speaking about the limitations and, and, and expect, uh, exceptions, I'm speaking specifically for libraries. So, and, and, and that's, that's how it should be viewed by, 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 by the committee. And then many of the section in the bill were adopted from Eiffel model copyright law clauses from other progressive copyright laws around the globe. So, our, our submission has been based not only uh, on what we think is good, but uh, only in South Africa, but we looked it around. And therefore, as Liasa, we believe that this bill is aligned to the constitution and international treaties and conventions. I was listening to colleagues, some of the colleagues here when they were saying, these things, they, they don't have a relationship with, with the countries that we used to have a relationship, colonial relationship, like UK and, the question is why should we? The question is why should we have that 
that why should they look like them? Why should they look? And and the first thing that came to my mind is our constitution. Does our constitution look like the the one of UK or you uh, or the other the countries that they mentioned? We we design our constitution based on what we thought was best. So we can't therefore limit ourselves around the issue to say now, because nobody has a similar constitution like ours, therefore we should try and make our constitution lesser. So every time when we do benchmarking, we must go for the best. So my understanding of benchmarking, you benchmark to see what, what good can you take from the other and how can you improve, but not to copy and just limit yourself because simply because other people are doing the same. So lastly, the, this bill remedies the unconstitutional issue in the current law uh, or in the current legislation. So in terms of the limitation and, and exceptions, section 9C of the bill does provide, uh, enable the libraries and archives to carry out their full statutory mandate without having to clear copyright and pay high fees in, in related digital environment. Chair, one of the speakers, uh, I think from Tauru, um, one of the things that, that they mentioned, um, for instance, Chair, uh, if you look at what the current uh, environment with, with Tauru, for instance, in terms of the, the, these academics work in universities, they are paid by, by, by public pairs, uh, by the tax man, they produce these, in, these resources being paid by the universities. And then what they do then, it, they publish them. They are already paid to work, to, to, to produce. They, are paid, they, 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 they produce the, 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 the information, then that information again is sold to the person who's paying them to produce it. That's what it means. In, in short, we, we pay you to write, the, to, to, to research and write, and then you write, then we buy it from you again. So it's like bubble dipping. But even if we were paying the, uh, the authors themselves, it would be much better. But if you look at the, 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 the value chain of, of the current uh, 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 copyright legislation, the money goes to Taro. Taro takes 30 to, uh, 25 to 30% administrative cost. It passes the next to, to the publisher. The publisher takes the, the bulk because he say, uh, I took the risk to publish a book, which is what they're saying. And then they probably give the author 5%. So that the, the, the issue that the author is losing out, it's actually not true because it currently, the copyright owner decides with the publisher, not even with the author, which is which is where the challenge is. So 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 in in we Liasa supports above exception as well as those of fair use exception for research, education, computer programming, all those relevant. Like the previous uh, speaker from start to mention, these are important for the for the developing country. We cannot find ourselves in a situation where we had to, we, where we are supposed to make sure that the education is affordable and it becomes unaffordable because of the high cost of, I mean, if you look currently in higher education sector, nine, almost 90% of the, of the, of the uh, revenue for, for, for academic books goes overseas. It's not local content, it's not local author. Most of the prescribed material comes from overseas, and 90% of that money is it's going offshore. And lastly, what I was saying, if, if it would be an interesting chair, if Dalro could have shared with you to say how much, uh, for instance, we, because university plays what we call blanket license. So they pay about 4.7 blanket license. And then how much of that 4.4 goes to the author? Uh, if you, if you, you would see that most of the money is kept by the middleman, and therefore there, that it benefits the author, it's, it's, it's not true. So just briefly, the benefits in terms of the, uh, the amendment bill is that the bill is progressive, it's forward looking, it empowers librarians and archives to carry out their statutory mandate. Two, 
It, the bill aligns the South African law with other progressive reg, uh, copyright regime and international treaties. Three, it introduced the limitations and exceptions for libraries and archives, which many developing countries have been enjoying for, the, for years. It goes a long way to redressing omission, restriction, and imbalances in the current copyright uh, regime. The bill also has been strongly supported by many international, regional, and local library and archive organizations and other institutions, as you would have seen in the last presentation from, from Prof. It also updates and future proofs on the, in terms of the copyright law for the 21st century and for IR. In conclusion, Chair, we, we therefore call upon Parliament to approve this bill once again and send it back to the President for urgent assent. Libraries and archives will then be empowered to carry out, out their statutory mandate and preserve their historical records and cultural memory for generations. All stakeholders, whether users, producers, custodian, creators, innovators, or publishers of knowledge will all benefit from the new progressive piece of legislation. I thank you. Thank you, Chair. And let's then uh, take this opportunity to extend the word of gratitude to uh, Mr. Mulepo for uh, responding uh, to our call uh, to uh, uh, put us in a much more better position as the committee to uh, be informed what is the their views as a structure in relation to the to, to the two bills. Uh, the uh, members, I guess that members are happy uh, with that presentation, uh, Mr. Mulepo, uh, and uh, without any waste of time, on behalf of them, uh, your uh, uh, response is appreciated. Uh, the word of gratitude to you, to the effort that we put as a structure in terms of government uh, along the way, uh, and sure that thank you, thank you, thank you. Great. We will now uh, move to the next uh, presenter, honorable members. Uh, the next uh, presenter in terms of uh, our our uh, agenda will be the uh, artist unite artist unite the platform is yours Artist Unite, Madia, can you help us? Yes, she, they are on the platform. I'm um, because I'm the, the Artist Unite is supposed to be represented by um, Ms. Kyla Jade, Ms. Mercy, Pakila, Ilek Kowali, and Ms. Sydney Mohopodi. Um, I did seem to see them on the platform earlier on, but I don't know where they are right now. Um, because they did indicate to me that they were on the platform. Yeah. Um, I can't seem to find them. I think they might have left. Um, let me just follow up with them, Chief. Yes, yes. Oh, are. actually, yeah they, yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. Just unite. The platform is yours. Artists Unite. Uh, there seems to be no response. Um, they're still busy joining. Uh, I think they're still busy connecting. Okay, all right.
Are they all connected to you? Artists Unite. Artists Unite, the platform is yours. And let's probably there, there are challenges. But I can see that they are on the platform. Um, Chi, just give me one moment. I'm gonna see if I can maybe try to call him. They're good. Oh, yes, Kayla. At this tonight, platform is yours. Are you still with us? Yes. The platform is yours. Kayla, how about with this woman? Calling us. Are we up already? Yes. yes. Thank you. He did been calling for such a long time. What? Yes. <laughs> You're joking. No, not really. Said. Mm -hmm. He's going to say not really. It's just been. Hi, can you guys hear us? We are. We are hearing you, and we are waiting for you to take the podium. Okay. You know, thank you. Thank you. We were scheduled for four. You threw me off a little bit. Oh, unfortunately, the one of our presenters had a challenge. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, our our humble and sincere apology to that. No. If you are ready, you can take the podium. It's all good. Um. Hi everyone. Uh, my name's Kyla. Some of you might know me as a convener at Recreate, um, an umbrella social movement, but I'm also um, a coordinator for a campaign called Artists Unite, which has been in operation doing a few things since about 2020. I'm also from the music industry. I'm a label and artist manager. I'm a creative director. And um, just a little bit about Artists Unite. It came out of workshops that we were having with creatives. Um, and we had quite a few legacy artists, young artists, community artists, not just musicians, not just actors, photographers, a whole bunch of people. And we really just wanted to also have the platform to speak um, to some of these you know, stories that were coming up and also have solidarity with communities because one of the main things about the way we do things is that it's artists and communities collectively. We've had support from you know, community organizations and similarly, Artists Unite has supported community organizations. When Blind SA did a demonstration outside the union buildings, Artists Unite was there doing a concert in solidarity. We had artists like Mara Lowe um, and a few others performing. Um, some of you might also remember last year, Marilo gave an uh, impassioned speech um, on behalf of Artists Unite at the public hearing that was quite publicized. Um, so yeah, we, we've done a few things and um, I just wanna establish, you know, what are some of our core beliefs? What are some of the main things, you know, we're focused on and, and, and the messages we wanna carry? One is that artists and communities can and should be united for fair just, copyright. Just, just fair my, my apology, just to remind you that you have 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So that you don't, uh, you are not left behind in terms of the gist of the bills. Okay, 30 minutes starting now. <laughs> um, Artists and communities should be united for fair copyrights and fair royalties. That historically musicians and actors and other uh, creators has been exploited. And you know, this shouldn't actually be a very controversial point, but it is according to some of the people, um, you know, who've been giving submissions is that, the, that this uh, system is still entrenched and that artists and creatives continue to be exploited and that we need urgent reform. We also uh, strongly believe that collecting societies need to be regulated. 
that actors should be paid fair royalties for productions that they help carry with their talent. This doesn't necessarily mean extras. No, that that can be handled in regulations and guidelines. And we don't believe that the bills say that extras will get royalties. Artists should have the right to recourse to renegotiate unfair contracts. That is quite a radical thing, we know, but historically they've been locked into extremely unfair contracts. There needs to be a progressive balance between information and culture sharing and access and the protection of copyright owners. So there needs to be a balance. Um, it's not just a ownership situation. This can be done in a way that improves protection for artists and copyright owners. Um, so in summary, we believe that the Copyright Amendment Bill and Performance Protection Amendment Bill uh, do this, do a great job of this, um, that copyright reform is an emergency and it's time that we actually have reform, um, that we should not be held ransom by major corporations that wish to continue a legacy of exploitation in Africa and make arguments like the industry is built on unfair exploitation and therefore it should continue on unfair exploitation and that most of the concerns that stakeholders have been bringing up can be handled in regulations and guidelines. Um, so in summary, essentially, we think that, you know, fair royalties and fair use coupled together um, can uh, actually work very nicely in balancing everything and don't necessarily disadvantage creatives. Um, we want to demystify some of the assumptions around fair royalties that copyright owners being accountable to creators does not mean the collapse of an industry, but is actually necessary to have a fair and regulated industry. And that we want to demystify some of the things around fair use, that actually fair use does not mean piracy. There's four well-established factors that uh, make it against piracy, while at the same time making it adaptable, which is necessary for the fourth industrial, fifth, sixth industrial revolutions, AI being an example where, you know, there's clauses in fair use that say you can't reproduce and replace somebody in the market, for example, which wasn't something that they thought of when they made fair use, but it's an example of why it's adaptable. Um, and yeah, so I don't want to take up more of your time. We want to actually use our, our time to go to some of the amazing and incredible artists um, that have been we've been connecting with. Uh, these are music legends um, who are going to be talking a little bit about their story and why it's important. Let me give over to Mercy. Thank you, Mercy. Um, so this is the everyone. Uh, this is Mercy Pagela. Uh, it's just a reminder of the fact that uh, in the 80s we had vibrant music that was music that was talking to the needs of our societies. Uh, as Mercy Pagela I would go back to a history in the music industry during apartheid regime system. Uh, in that era, we were mouthpieces of our societies and mouthpieces of our government, and our government that we were praying for. We stood fast when others were in exile and others were not even born in the creative arts fraternity. Uh, we were exploited. I mean, if you talk of our contracts, you know, we, we, we signed the, 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 the standard contracts, which are contracts that consist of 3% of 90%. Of you know, and the artist performers like me, I was signed for 3% from 90%. And that was an extreme exploitation. And in, it was not only me. It was even those artists who were there before me, the likes of Mamu Margaret Mtsingana, who got stroke on stage, and she was not insured, and she was never covered. 
up to the last days of her life. And uh, you know, uh, this bill today, when I, when I went through the bill with, 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 with some of my fellow musicians, the bill is at least today securing us, you know, and protecting us uh, on, on fair use and fair royalties. You know, all those issues were not there before. Now we are covered and protected. We were n will never say no to signing of this bill. This is Braom Alec Khawudi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thanks to everyone. I'm really very privileged to be given this opportunity to address you. Uh, I'm one, my name is Alec Khawudi. Some people know me as Om Alec Khawudi. And I have been a musician in the times when uh, you wouldn't advise your children to become musicians because of the legacy of the industry which has been so terrible. Uh, we all know and we, have, we all have read that, uh, especially we South African musicians, most of us have been, have been, have, 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 have had pauper's funerals and uh, it's, it's been pathetic, it's been painful. A lot of families have suffered because of this. So uh, in my career, I started with a band called The Beaters who, and we later were called Harari. I was a founder member of this band uh, as a bass player who was self-taught and who relied on creating something in order that you should survive. So even our music was composition. We just used to write our own songs and so on and so on. So, um, but in the process, we need to be famous, we need to eat, we need to do all of this. So we go to this record company and uh, we are given a contract which you sign. Uh, if you don't sign the contract, you don't get a recording deal. And we had to sign these contracts. And as, as uh, Messi Pakela have just stated now, that uh, these contracts were very, very evil in that uh, imagine getting 3% of 90%. This is exactly what I, I went through myself. I remember being paid uh, something like eight rand, you know, to per side of a record and not even getting royalties thereafter. You know, that's, this, is, this, is, this, this is the industry. So uh, I remember in, in my case, I've been, I, 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 I was signed to a record company, uh, on those kind of terms, and not knowing that my music would be popular in, in, in future. And, uh, and then my music became popular and uh, became international. It was known around the world. And uh, to this date, there are people around the world who, are, who, 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 want, who, who still want to use my music to do uh, uh, video, uh, music, I, I mean films and stuff like that. I know that at, the, at this stage there is, a, there is something like that happening in, in my case. And uh, the record company that owns my music are standing in between me and the people who are to u utilize my music. And they dictate their own royalty, they, they, they dictate their own uh, 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 amount, fee, that they charge, which which, 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 is, which is so unfair. And, and they are going to now take the, the, that money that they receive into their account, keep it for nine months, and then that money will probably be making interest in their accounts. And then at the time when they, 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 they after nine months that they start to, then they begin to pay me that meager percentage which I agreed to when I was a boy, when I was still a child. Today I'm 74 years old, and I'm still struggling 
to, 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 to sort out this problem. And I believe that I am not the only one. I believe that a lot of us are going through the same thing. It is very, very, it's painfully unfair to have to, 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 to live with this, with this, with this, with this, with this legacy. So uh, I, I, I am here to support what, what, what we stand for as, 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 the, as, the, as the Artists Unite, that uh, this, 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 this bill be passed. So I'm desperately pleading with whoever is in, 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 in power to, to really v visit this thing, because I do not want to see my children going through this. And it's, I'm, when I'm talking about my children, I'm talking about your children. Because if this stays, if the, if the status quo remains this way, your children are going to suffer what I'm going through. And this is what we have to begin to, to look seriously into, and we, we should stop making jokes about about it or bargaining or things like this. It is, it is time that we look at this uh, uh, as, 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 with a more serious and more human uh, uh, point of view. So uh, I would like to refer, I would like to, 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 to introduce you to Mr. Sidney Mukhopudi, whom you know very well. <laughs> My name is Sydney Bakang Mokhopudi, popularly known as Mama's Baby. Uh, I started, uh, entered the music industry in 1989. That is, these were the people, the Messi Pakelas and the Om Alek Haudis, were the people I adored and loved so much. And it is a privilege to me today to find myself really rubbing shoulders with them, being able to enjoy lunch with them. Um, but having said that, uh, I want to, to say we, 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 we inherited a legacy that wasn't completely fair. Uh, we, we, this industry, in this industry you find a man sitting with a contract. I believe a contract is an agreement between two parties. But you find a man sitting with a contract saying it is an agreement between the two of you when the man drafted that contract alone. Now, all the terms and conditions suit him. And then they tell you, no, this is a standard agreement, you have to sign it, and we sign on the dotted lines. I must say, I must point out uh, that we, we, we come from a very, uh, what would I say, unprivileged, disadvantaged, that's the word. We come from a very disadvantaged uh, group in that our education system itself, we were taught, I was taught how to, 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 to label a locust, a head, thorax, and abdomen. Now all of a sudden I come into the music industry, now I meet something different. I mean, how would I have known that I shouldn't have given my rights to someone else? I mean, as a songwriter, as a composer, I should have the right to control what my works. Now. What, it is hap what is happening now is I see my works all over YouTube. I saw Alec Cowdy, I saw Messi Pakela's works all over YouTube. I don't even know who uploaded those songs, who is making revenue from those songs. So somewhere, this industry must be regulated. I mean, even, even the, 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 what we call the housemates, the helpers, have certain rights. Even our children have rights. Why is it that musicians don't have rights? Even their rights are not even constituted. We are just people on the street. So we are pleading to this government that this, this I have gone through the, 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 this bill and it's, it's okay. I think this bill must be passed because otherwise we will, we will pass the baton to our children and they also will inherit nothing. I mean, at my age, I'm nearing retirement now. I'm an old man already, I have grandchildren, and I have nothing to show for them. It is not right. I can't be still paying rent when I'm a songwriter of, 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 of high caliber. And we have been in this industry through apartheid time, and we still are in this industry. And Messi Pakela is still Messi Pakela. Om Ale Kaudi is still Om Ale Kaudi even today. But what do we have to show for it? 
So I think we, 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 we did a lot of spade work also for this government to be in power. Now this government is in power. We want to see our rights being represented. I don't think it, 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 it's really fair, it would be fair really that I keep shaking the tree and somebody just comes in to pick up apples. So, yeah, it's, it's really, it's really not, not fair. Now, if this bill is passed, at least we'll have someone to can talk to. Not like before, we didn't have anyone to speak to. If we have a problem with our agreement, there's no one to help us there. With the, I mean, right now, my, my music is still selling even today, and I'm not getting even a cent from it. But the song is still mine. I'm still Sydney. I'm still the singer of the song we and the writer of, of the song. Else. You know, you're reminding of some, me of something else. Yes. You know how many kids who remix Ayati Samadik, yeah. even up to today, you know, these young kids are remixing Ayati Samadik. And on reproduction, I am entitled to some exactly you know and right. of those remixes mm. yeah. and i am not getting no royalties i haven't received royalties since 1990 from all these major record companies mm -hmm. and because the record company that i was signed with uh, was signed with it, it was it, the distribution was the yeah. di distribution of these major record companies yeah. which are internationally owned you know the true tones till records and, uh, and universals yeah. and you know they are you internationally see. owned and I mean how do we develop the economy of our country if we are going to be you know assigned you to international owned record companies that is our story yes. that is true <laughs> that is our story it's our story mm -hmm. um, so I'd just like to add a few things to what you've said as we wrap up before we go to Q&A mm -hmm. And I just want to add that, you know, essentially based, a lot of these contracts we were talking before were signed in the early 70s and, you know, really ages ago when, I mean, we were speaking, Um Alec was telling us, you know, the, the record label he was signed to, you know, kept making break and broken promises, didn't give him much resources, he had to finance his own studio, mm -hmm. he paid, he had to organize his own gigs. Uh, they really w was given terrible treatment. Um, sometimes they would say, like, here's 30 minutes in the studio, go, go make a song. That's that all you true. get. Yes. Um, yet these major record labels walk away with the lion's share of, of, these, of these works that these creatives have Absolute. made under yes. terrible circumstances. And those contracts signed during apartheid, they still have to live by decades later. And there's, no, there's nothing for them to, to go back and say, okay, well, this is unfair and I should actually be making more royalties. You know, this thing of, you know, who's exploiting their work. Even if we do solve the monetization on YouTube, who owns the, who owns the copyrights? How much royalties are they able to get from that copyright? And these, this is all part of transformation and the work of transformation. And just going back to, um, you know, the, the access to legal recourse, the, the tribunal is so important for this and um, artists being able to go to the tribunal is so important for this <coughs> and yes our legal systems if we put the right energy in and we draft proper regulations for the bills will be able to handle this and we'll have important cases like Um Ali Khaudi who will be able to you know get a fair share of his royalties and will establish legal precedent for what is fair. Definitely the, 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 the performers tribunal has to be established to protect us and to enable us to go and, and, and deal with the injustices of the past and the present. Thank you, government, for this bill, for the hard work you've done to put together this bill. We thank you. Okay, you're muted, Honorable Kenny. Good, thank you, thank you. My apology for that. Uh, uh, my appreciation to to Macy Pagela from Alec and Mama's baby. Uh, it was uh, refreshing to to hear your voices. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, you have said a mouthful. Uh, uh, we have had the artist unite. 
Uh, I will just check from the members of the select committee uh, whether do they have anything to say. Uh, but of course, uh, the the uh, the uh, platform created as correctly said right at the beginning is to converse uh, uh, views of critical stakeholders in response to the to the uh, taking of the bill, uh, which uh, uh, it was agreed that uh, it, 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 it must be sent to the National Council of Province so that we can further engage uh, with it. Uh, the National Assembly has passed the bill. Uh, how it was then uh, seconded to us. Uh, so that we can have a, have, a, have, a, have, a, have a public consultation also, because it is a matter that affects province. I see that we have a, a, a Honorable Prateseth and then Honorable Dango. Uh, Tim, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Um, hello, Chair. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Chair. Yeah, that, uh, that presentation brought back memories of Harari from the early 80s. I remember them. I remember them. Um, <clears throat> Chair, with, with great respect to the presenters, um, I just want to clarify something. I don't think anybody here would argue the fact that if you've produced a, a, a produced an artist, uh, if you if you produced a, a, a musical production or a musical work, that you should get fair compensation based on the success of that work. Um, I think it's very important to draw that line there. It must be the success of the work because there are, there are many artists. Look, the, the music industry, I'm sure the presenters will agree and the artists will agree is a very, very tough industry. Um, and it's, it's, it's tough to succeed because it's, it's so competitive. Um, and I don't think anybody would disagree that if you've produced a musical production um, that you should get your fair shake of whatever the success of that is. But are we arguing that regardless of the success of the, of the work, all artists must get the same royalty, must get the same benefit, regardless of what the success of the work is out in the market? And that's just what I want to carry to you on from the presenters. Um, is it based on the success of the product? Or is it just based on a, on, a, on a standard across the board? So regardless of the quality of the production, everybody gets the same, the same rewards. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Honorable uh, Dango, let's, let's, let's uh, give over to uh, Ambassador Dango first before <clears throat> respond. Hello, Jefferson. The presentations I was listening to were legal presentations, or presentations from the business community. This last presentation was a presentation from the artists from the art and really moved me in a particular direction. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ambassador. Uh, let's uh, end the response to that. Well, in, 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 um, in, we, we, we actually know that it, it, it's common sense that um, we, the, the remuneration will go will be according to the success of a product. It will not be just a general and blanket on, on everything. Yeah, for instance, I mean, we, 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 we end by sales. You know, if your record sells yes. enough, and that you and then you get the payment enough payment you know but in relation to your sales in relation to your sales yes, yes. and uh, and uh, you know we earn by credits you know some of our works were taken by promoters by managers and they took credit of our works and of which we need to reclaim those works because it does not belong to them. Yes. It does not even belong to, your gen to their generations to come. It belongs to our generations to come. How can we have a heritage, a legacy without heritage? You know, I mean, you cannot uh, say a you have a legacy when you do not have the heritage. If your heritage is kept in the archives of another family and of another generation, I mean, you definitely do not have a legacy, you know, and you won't have 
anything to fall back okay. on. So we need to reclaim our heritage from the archives of the internationally owned record companies. And that's how we can earn a living. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Team Artists Unite uh, for, for the uh, uh, response and also for the presentation we have heard you. Your, your demand is simple. Uh, you want to benefit in the whole value chain. I think that's what you are saying. Uh, you are saying that let's 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 uh, uh, support the bill because uh, of its transformative nature. Uh, we are still continuing with our with our, with our public hearing. We still have another two 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 sessions uh, uh, because of the manner in which the public has responded. But let me take this uh, opportunity on behalf of the select committee. Uh, of trade and competition uh, to express a word of gratitude to the uh, manner in which we have responded to our invite to you. Uh, clearly, uh, it touched, it touched our, 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 our hearts because uh, you are in the field, you are in the industry, you understand its complexity, you understand uh, where you come from, uh, you have gone through some successes and challenges. So uh, we, we are looking forward to further engagement. And on behalf of the committee, uh, allow me to express a word of gratitude to you. Thank you, thank you, Artist Unite. Any last word from your side? We thank, we thank government for the initiative. We thank our government for making sure that he takes this bill around and we have read it and some of the clause are talking to our needs. So we pray that the bill, it gets passed, gets signed so that we can be able to reclaim our territory. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mercy, uh, for that. Uh, Madia? Where are we now? Hi, Chi. <clears throat> Chi, um, that was the last presentation. Um, Mr. Goodwill Mbata has not rejoined the platform, so I don't think that he was able to make it in time. Um, but as you advise, we will try to find a slot for him at our sessions, our next sessions, um, taking place on the 7th and the 14th of March, respectively. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Madia. Uh, Honorable members, uh, our stakeholders that uh, graced our, our he public hearing today, uh, allow me on behalf of the committee to uh, express uh, a word of sincere gratitude to all of you for taking part in uh, today's public hearing. Uh, indeed, it gives us a, a better appreciation and comprehension in terms of uh, the complexities of what is involved in this industry. Uh, the, the audio audiovisual industry, uh, the what is involved in the value chain, uh, what is the economies of scale in the in the value chain, uh, and and more than that, the role that the creative sector is also playing in terms of its contribution to the cross uh, domestic product, uh, the growth of our economy. Uh, but more than that, I think what is quite critical is the need to ensure that. Uh, uh, the broadening of the of the creative uh, sector uh, does take place. Uh, it is important that uh, the challenges, whether they are structural in nature, uh, must be addressed so that we broaden the cake, uh, we broaden the participation, but more than that, uh, ensure that uh, uh, there is uh, there is uh, uh, no space for exploitation of uh, of, uh, of, of of our of our artists. Thank you uh, for attending today's uh, meeting. The meeting stands adjourned until we meet on the 7th of March. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you.